Okay, good morning everyone and thank you for attending this workshop. Um, as Dr. Bull said, I do take care of early childhood here at Concordia, both undergrad and grad. And um, if we go to the next slide, you can follow along with, I just want you to know what I do and perhaps that will help you as we go through the um, presentation this morning. Um, I also serve as the director of the Play Institute. We are excited about that and we are hopefully going to team up with the Alliance for Childhood and do some research as we study the crisis in the kindergarten. But uh, I also direct the annual Early Childhood Literacy Festival on the lake in August. would love to invite you to come up. We're, we do that every August. And again, the Play Institute has a presence there and we do have um, nationally known uh, authors and illustrators at that event. So, um, today, let's go to the next slide. I want to start with what I'm sure you're all familiar with, that in America we currently have a federal mandate called the Ch No Child Left Behind. And I am totally in favor of not leaving even one child behind. It's a noble goal for education and one which is approved by, I would say, the vast majority of all Americans. But as other as often happens to a noble goal. As it becomes implemented and the assessment processes begin, um, the success can be distorted and pretty soon we're not focusing on children but we are focusing on the numbers and the content instead of the process for the young child. In this case I believe the implementation of this program has created a one-way only way rigidity that has actually created yet another potential unfortunate crisis. And it is actually being called in early childhood the crisis in the kindergarten. We have an obsession in, and it seems and a pressure for accountability with this program. We need higher test scores and from this higher stakes testing uh, teachers are so nervous about keeping their jobs that creative time, imagination time, pretend time, which is okay, we know that's thinking, um, it's disappearing from our pre-kindergarten and kindergarten classes. It's almost all gone from primary. And these are little early childhood people too. Let's go back to Albert Einstein and we think of him as one of the greatest thinkers um, possibly ever in America. And he he is famous for saying imagination is everything. Imagination is more important than knowledge. We know knowledge is important, but if we don't know how to process that knowledge and run it through our brain and make it work in our life, what use is it is basically what I think Einstein was trying to say. Um, I don't know if any of you have read anything by Karen Egan. Now I don't have a slide on uh, Professor Egan, but his name is spelled K-I-E-R-E-N, last name E-G-A-N. And he is well known for his work on imaginative educational endeavors. Uh, two of my favorite books of his are, are some of the first books he wrote in the early 90s. And they're called Imagination in Teaching and Learning and Teaching and Storytelling. Again, I'm going to say those two again because they are very fascinating books. Imagination in teaching and learning, I mean, I'm sorry, teaching as storytelling. In these books, Kieran Egan asserts that imagination is and should be at the center of meaningful learning. So I take it one step Farther, since play is defined as encompassing elements of both creativity and imagination, play should also be at the center of meaningful learning. So if it is disappearing from kindergarten classrooms, again the crisis in the kindergarten, is it gone? Do we say goodbye to it forever as something of the past that wasted our children's time? Can it never return and be of any use? to teaching and learning? A big no on that one because then I would be out of a job. No, I'm just kidding. But it is there and that's part of our, that's why I like our title, it's there but do we use it? When we don't use play it's like anything. Its growth is stunted 
and its effectiveness is no longer trusted as a valid tool. And I think that's what's happening, because it indeed is a tool for learning. And um, this tool is a way to real solutions and a wonderful way to teach and learn at all ages. Because play changes as our thinking changes. As we move from pre-operational thought to concrete operational thought to formal operations, and that would include our middle, middle schoolers, our high schoolers. And I have subbed in 7th and 8th grade. Now, I'm early childhood, so that was interesting for me. But I, I identified many of the children in that classroom as still ha using some of those thought processes that four-year-olds use. And therefore, I felt that's why they were struggling. Um, now, most of their thinking was at a more formal or concrete stage. But play, humor, it, especially humor and um, enjoyable endeavors with teaching and learning are so important. Um, because, as I'll say frequently this morning, emotion drives cognition. None of us were bored into wisdom. Um, so let's not forget also that a strong argument can be made for what Vivian Gusson Paley calls, quote, the critical role of fantasy play in the psychological, intellectual, and social development of children. Our next slide, then I believe. Yes, Vivian Paley was a kindergarten teacher for 37 years at the University of Chicago Laboratory Schools. And she has received numerous awards and accolades. Just two of them are one MacArthur Award and then, of course, the John Dewey Award. And she was a kindergarten teacher and really has been respected as one of our most premier teacher researchers in America. She is the author of 11 books, three of which are published by the University of College Press. Today I will be referring primarily to her book called A Child's Work, The Importance of Fantasy Play. But I would recommend most of her books, and we use them for book, pop, book talks on campus frequently with the Play Institute and also with the Literacy Festival. Students often take graduate credits, and what we do is study a book by a premier author in early childhood. <clears throat> Now, we know that young children are amazing dramatic fantasy players. They play with ideas by playing and pretending with objects, episodes, stories, and roles. They are resilient and flexible little people. You know what? Children are also very eager to please their teachers as they deal with these overly structured test-based classroom atmospheres. And sometimes I'd l I look at them and I think they're saying, now I don't know this, but I think they're thinking, okay, we'll, recite, we'll recite those names of the squiggly black lines and forms adults call letters and numbers and words. We'll make those guttural vowel sounds for you and hold our pencils correctly. Children can and do learn amazing things, often, often rapidly and confidently. But at what cost? There is currently no empirical research evidence that sooner is better. Earlier literacy, immersion, and rote instruction is better than a natural mode of learning through play, a more balanced. It's not that we don't teach the letters and sounds. Great. But, but right now, I believe I'm seeing a growing unnatural focus. On, on this haste. We have to get them here by this point or we fail. Then in first grade they have to be here and if pre-K and kindergarten teachers don't do that, the system has failed. And what we're doing is failing the children because that's just nonsense. We don't want to be treated like that as adults, as teachers, as professionals. And why should we treat our children that way? <clears throat> Learning something at an earlier age than what is natural is what we term in the early childhood world as inappropriate. All of the rote learning and high scores have little meaning for young children, and I'd like to talk about this a little bit more. At early ages, children, though very intelligent and high-achieving individuals, 
in certain rote recitation and identification tasks. I'm going to just keep that in your mind now. I was just in a classroom last week, and she said, but Dr. Sider, look. Look at what they memorized. Look at what they wrote. And then I said, did you play it out with them? Did you, did you find out if they understood the characters? Did, well, no, I used to do that. And the thing is, the children in kindergarten, and I'm mostly in first grade too, do not have the ability yet to handle abstractions that provide meanings to what they have written on the paper, being told exactly what to write and what to write it. You see, play, also divide, defined as creativity and imagination, is that needed glue, that glue that takes those abstractions and connects it. It connects the content, which can be heavy. They can do it, but it connects it to the process. And so then it becomes a stronger thread in their brain as they're building those synapses. I'd like like to say that I think play creates the why, it creates the importance, it creates the goal and the dream. And don't we all need that in our own life? Why am I doing it? Why is it important? What is my goal? What is my dream? This leads to experimenting. It leads to trial runs and finally the discovery of the connections. And I believe middle schoolers need this too. They need to do the hands-on. Experiment with it. No, that doesn't work. Instead of just saying, well, this doesn't work, this is known to work, memorize it, and make sure you can put it on the test. Is there more work in a play-based, um, creative, or imaginative-based classroom? No, it's just a different kind of work that we have then. And we require a different kind of work. Yes, they read. Yes, they write. I'm, not, I'm certainly not against literacy learning. But I am for the discovery of connections. I feel the connections are being lost. That's the power of play. So play is there, but it's often not used or utilized. It's a wonderful phenomenon children use to make sense of their world and schooling and all subject matter. It's those revered three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. And those go back to our forefathers. Nothing wrong with them, but if that's all that's there, it's, it's pretty slim. And as Donald Pink, Daniel Pink, I'm sorry, who wrote The Whole New Mind, would say, are we creating robots? Or are we building creative thinkers? Um, our challenge is to balance this. But everyone says, how do we do it? We have so much pressure. We have the common core standards. I'm not against standards. We have to have them. But I'm saying, can we meet them in creative ways? Can we as teachers model the creativity? On next slide, then. Um, play, um, I have met Vivian Paley, and I want to go back to her because I'm going to talk about some of the things she has talked about in her groups with play. She is a de delightfully real and humble person, but yet an assertive, outspoken champion for children and their need to play, the unfairness of certain classroom environments. She believes that children need to play to learn to succeed at being human beings. Forget the test scores. Um, she is such a powerful example of teacher research. When I talked to Mrs. Paley and called her a researcher, she laughed out loud and said, I don't look at myself that way. I'm just a teacher. These are just my books about how my classroom works. And I thought, yeah, and it works pretty well, and it's distinctive enough for you to be a continual award winner. She said, I don't see myself the way you see me, but I thanked her for inspiring me because the third piece of my play research during my development of the, my dissertation and my doctoral studies, I called my third play type dramatic story reenactment, which definitely focused on the importance of fantasy play in building communication between children. And that actually my study did 
um, record many significant relationships in the use of the three play types. And I do have a lot, a lot, I do owe her a lot and hope someday I can show her that. We want to invite her up to Concordia next year. On another topic with Paley, she asserts, as I said before, that play is a natural mode, but that it requires work. Um, just like using play, humor, imagination in your classroom does require work. And I, I wonder if you might like to try this exercise with your friends who value play. And I wish you were here because we would try this together. But you can do some of this a little later, right where you're sitting. But um, as we're striving to understand how children use play so effectively, we have to keep reminding what it was like. We have to try to remember and remind our own mind what it was like to play in a child's world. And um, some of the strategies we used when we were children, guess what? They help us be successful in our adult world. So number one, pretend you are a child and are with children who are playing. Now, think back to when you were playing as a child. This is actually some notes I took from a play mentoring session for teachers. And we've actually run these in the Play Institute. And we surprised ourselves. We learned a lot of things, but not exactly what we thought <laughs> oh, we were going to learn. Um, Ask yourself, what am I trying to accomplish? What stands in my way? In my pre-kindergarten classroom, I saw children, they didn't use those big words, but teacher, we're trying to have a picnic, and they're in the way with their blocks. So they knew right away, this is what we want to do, and they're in our way with their blocks. And I, so we had to negotiate. We had to talk to the other children. And as adults, we would say, can I accept my friend's point of view? My friend decided he needed that space for his blocks. At Concordia, my friends decide they need that space for their classroom or for their, their workshop. So I need to find another space. Or we learn to playfully negotiate. So the next step would be, can I stay committed to the play script and be loyal to my good friends? That's very key in good negotiation. Or do I stomp off, throw my toys, and say, forget it. I don't like you. Which obviously we all know doesn't work real well in the world as we get older. Doesn't work real well in kindergarten either. How do we as a group invent exciting stories and exciting fantasies? But more importantly, how do we play them out? Um, on your screen, you'll see the balanced curriculum direct teaching and learning, guided teaching and learning, spontaneous play, which is exploration and discovery. Um, right now, what I'm seeing is frustrated teachers in the classroom who think they are required to do directed teaching and learning 90% of the day. To the children's credit, they are cooperating. Their writing looks amazing. For kindergarten but when I ask where's what do they think about this or that what is their impression she it, it mostly gives the teachers pause because after we do direct teaching we have to step back and we have to say is it time now for maybe a more guided teaching and learning meaning I'm going to guide what happens in my classroom now I taught them this methodology. They showed me they could do it on paper. Now, you have a choice to apply this in several centers in my classroom, in our classroom together. And you're going to have to work together on the next project we're doing. But they have a voice, and they have a choice, and my voice is limited, although I'm always there to guide support as they choose the tools that they now use to enrich what we have learned together in large group. And then a key, key point with fantasy play, if I don't ever allow children to spontaneous play, choose, create their own story, explore and discover, when are they going to learn how to do it? 
will they know how to do it when they um, are hired? What kind of jobs, what kind of places will hire them? We live in an economy driven by innovation and knowledge. In marketplaces, engaged in intense competition and constant renewal. To be competitive, we need to be creative, imaginative. And as I was watching a YouTube the other day um, with one of the IDEO uh, executives leading it, he said, we're very hands-on here. We're pre-K 101. I loved it. And I go, great. And his whole presentation at that very formal conference was he had so many things that the people were doing from their seats, playing and throwing it on stage. And he said, how we come up with our inventions is first hands-on. We listen, we write, but our first artifact looks more like a toy, even though it may be a surgeon's tool. Very, very interesting. And we are partnering with corporate America as educators. Our, will our children walk in when they're adults? sign up and say, OK, tell me what you can do, because I understand all this math and science, but just tell me what you want me to make. No. You tell us what you can create, knowing what we give you. With, we'll give you the content and the knowledge. Now you create. Now, of course, these people, yes, you need to understand the basic content in science and math. And I, I believe in academic rigor. But I think we're out of balance. And we're spiraling further out of balance. It is a crisis in the kindergarten. Please download that artifact. If you Google the crisis in the kindergarten, it'll, it'll be the first thing that pops up on your screen. You may download all of it. And um, <coughs> John, Al John, I'm sorry, Joan Allman and Ed Miller um, authored the piece. It's a 76-page. I think it's got 12 short chapters, and it includes research from both coasts, New York and Los Angeles, as they interviewed and collected data from kindergarten teachers where they realized there was a crisis. 15 minutes of play left in kindergarten. And often, Joan told me, she was a guest on our campus. Again, if you are looking for a wonderful speaker on this topic, she's a national speaker explaining how children learn best. She really um, hit a home run on our campus. But she said often that 15 minutes, Candy, is seven minutes when they arrive in the morning where they kind of run around the room, pick up a toy, and then all of a sudden the bell rings. And then in the evening when they're, um, they have eight minutes to get ready to go home. And I said, Joan, I don't call that play. I call that lining up, getting in my coat and my lunch pail, and going home. And she's, well, yeah, she said that we did let them count it, but it is frightening. So, um, but it's a very positive piece. And, and Joan is very positive, and she said things are happening that give her hope. And um, play is work, just as the three R's are work, but it is exciting, stimulating work, and it is usually based on children's stories and children's thoughts. We need to recapture the childhood play. A child's play reveals a way to understand the child and to assess the child. We can't just assess the child with um, rigid assessment tools. Some of the assessment tools are wonderful, but we have to also look at their play and what they're talking about. We can't separate the play from the child's story. In fact, we know a story is developing our mind. If we know a story is developing, our minds listen up and work oh so much better. So, if it's so great, you're saying, why do adults lose the ability to participate in dramatic fantasy play? We, we kind of get embarrassed when we're asked to role play. We, go, we have faculty retreats here. We have school of ed retreats. And sometimes we have to do that. And we're all just a little bit self-conscious. And that's not really um, surprising because we are in a formal operational thinking stage. We can manipulate those abstractions in our minds. We don't even have to talk about them. We can just think about them in the abstract without 
that physical manipulation. We don't have to build something. We don't even have to write it. We can think it. However, even as adults, we know. Like, you're having a, I have a few slides for you today, and that's important that you're using another sensory mode. We are also multi-sensory and created that way by God. <clears throat> I should note here that my graduate students in the Early Childhood Master's Program at Concordia are still multi-sensory, and certainly I've noted they think better with certain hands-on activities as together we play with certain ideas and some very heavy philosophies. Tomorrow is our center day in class. We'll be doing our portfolios and we break up as they're waiting for their turn to come to me for more directed instruction. <laughs> I'll be guiding them through centers and spontaneous play as our classroom is set up with some very primitive but still interesting um, centers. So it's there for adults and they do need it, but the balance is different. Just like the balance would be different with middle school and for fourth and fifth graders. <clears throat> Karen Egan puts it another way. He believes teachers should always ask before they plan, before they start their day, what is the story in what I am teaching? Even if it's math or science, social studies, <coughs> even if it's for middle school. In fact, his imagination book is for middle school, but I loved it, and I'm early childhood. So uh, this, this, this play piece crosses the ages. Knowledge and content, again, I will repeat, is important because it feeds the imagination. It's the food for thought. But always remember, knowledge and content makes so much more sense embedded in a story that we can act out either in paper, on our mind, or actually with others. <clears throat> um, the pretend actions that children use in their early years prepare them for a later time when they have the ability to coordinate and accomplish those actual feats that they're playing with. And I'd like to think of it this way. We have threads of thought and action that are created when we're four, five, and six-year-olds when we're master players. That's when human beings are master players. Children are much better players of fantasy than we are now, no matter what degrees we have. That's what's so sad to me, that we would say, no, you can't play in kindergarten. That's what they're the best at, and we are like tying their arms behind their back. But um, when we um, meet for our first day of my graduate play course, the play theory and practice course, we do some sharing, introduce each other, and one of the ways we do it is I ask the class to close their eyes, think back, look back, and feel back to the time in their lives when they were five years old. I want them to picture themselves at five. And I say, do you see yourself? You could play along here. Do you see yourself? There you are. What are you playing? The next slide. Um, here are some of the things they said. Um, I always played Barbie dolls. Now, you, you can't see me or you can't see their faces, but I did. And their faces totally lit up. Okay, our class starts at 8 o'clock on Saturday morning. This was about 8.15. And they woke up because they were remembering something fun, something about that they created, something they did that occupied their minds and that they learned. Learned how to interact with others, perhaps, or many other things. Another individual, um, the one male in my class, he said, I remember my backyard army battles with my G.I. Joe figures. We buried them in the trenches. We fought all day. We went home dirty. We left our Joes and our, our little plastic figures buried out there. And, 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 and the next day was another day to continue the, the battle. And um, of course, the the females in the group got a big kick out of that. And then the very next person said she was a ballerina. And in fact, the next, ne next class session, she brought a picture of herself as a ballerina. She said, I was always leaping and flying and swinging on the swing set, on the bars. But I had to have my ballerina tutu on to do this. 
That was my goal. And then another said, pretend picnics with dolls, pretend train trips with dolls. My sister and I, we would play in chapters. But that was interesting. And then the last example, playing school with neighborhood children. After much conversation and they started talking and enthusiastically remembering and laughing about what they did as children when they played in a, in a fantasy dramatic mode. And most of them, as you'll see here, they did describe fantasy play with other people and not a toy. Now, a Barbie doll is a toy, but she did go into detail about the accessories and um, uh, d making clothes with her mother for this doll. The second thing I asked of the class that morning was to write down what you like to play now. I said, close your eyes again, see yourself now, pretend you're somewhere else, and I know you wouldn't want to be anywhere else but in this classroom, but if you could be anywhere else playing now, what would you be doing? And um, as an adult, and so often, the students connected their playful childhood threads to more powerful threads that have now um, grown and represent their playing as an adult. The Barbie girl um, is still very much into accessories and shopping and does uh, do more sewing and also plays with her daughter with this in the same fashion. The Backyard Battles man still plays similar games with his son. He's also very much an outdoor aficionado. He uh, turns bowls, beautiful bowls. He cuts down trees. And he said his most fun time as an adult is spending time outside with both of his children. Um, the ballerina still flies and jumps, but she's a skydiver. She's a risk taker. She's a kayaker in Alaska. She said, I never took up ballet, but I do like the soaring and the flying and the, she said, I, I still am drawn to it. The pretending with dolls, that young woman has a doll collection that she also brought a picture of. Playing school, you guessed it, she's a teacher. So it does matter what we play as children. Um, I, as you've guessed, I am a play advocate and I'm fascinated with the power that it has in developing imaginative teaching strategies. But, and as an early educator, I want balance for children while they are playing, creating, and imagining. I know they will be better prepared for and understand the knowledge they will accumulate if they play. Because play provides that passion, that emotion, that drives cognition. As I said before, we aren't bored into wisdom or knowledge. We have to, there has to be an interest facts factor, an inspiration factor. I challenge my college students every day to strive for a balance in their teaching. And I, I know you've all heard of Lev Vygotsky, a Russian psychologist, found that children use behaviors and language well above expected levels for their ages when they play. So, if they act like four-year-olds every other time at the dinner table or when they're in church, when they're at play, they may be at a five- and six-year level in their language and their behavior. His most favorite, famous saying, Vygotskyan saying, was, play is a tool of the mind, and language is the tool of play. Very thought-provoking. Why would we treat a child in school as if he or she was only a cognitive being and not consider the social, physical, emotional, and spiritual dimension of the child's de development as well. And basically, that's what Vygotsky was saying. I use modern National Association of the Education of the Young Child, NACI words, but he said the child is a social being and the play is a tool to help the mind work more efficiently. And without language, the child couldn't play. So the two are very synergistic and work together. And language is such the centerpiece of the no child left behind. But it's by itself and actually in a subordinate position to play. We have to have play to make it all work. 
personally, I feel fortunate that I have attended schools with teachers that have nurtured my imagination. And I had parents that were playful, always valuing our play and asking us what if questions, why not questions. That's a simple way to start as teachers. What if it wasn't this way? Why not try this? Why not? Could it be this way? What would it look like if? <clears throat> On a sadder note, I guess, uh, my students who are dedicated to play-based strategies and have worked to understand these developmental principles are now constructing eagerly their own perspectives of play in a balanced curriculum. For right now, in this part of the 20th century, the early part, they will need an extra measure of confidence, don't you think, and determination to use the play and not set it aside in frustration and fear that they will be considered not doing their job to make room for teaching inappropriate testing in search of the perfect test score, the perfect place to be for our school. I apologize for the bleak statements because we do see evidence of a healthy play movement waving, making waves across the nation. Right now the pendulum is still far up there and it needs to drop and I think it will. Many schools and teachers still adhere to developmentally appropriate play practices for young children. Um, I notice that many of our private schools especially do not seem as bound, our private and our religious and Christian schools, to this mandate in the same way. They're following it, but not in the same way. Having said all that, I'm still eager for my students, and I know they're eager and ready for the challenges of he ahead. I want to share a little story, um, a true story, but another sad little story about a little six-year-old boy in the first grade. Um, I heard this from a student teacher. He was listening intently to her. And um, the cl I, this was first semester, so they were about in October. And she said, I want you all to pretend to be polar bears in a cold climate. She goes, now think about polar bears. What would you be doing? And the one little boy shyly raised his hand and said, teacher, what does pretend mean? So she used the word imagine, and he said, I don't know that one either. Is that shocking? Yes. Yeah but maybe no. Going back to our theme today, play will always be there. The child may forget it or don't know the words. It may be left to collect dust in the wings behind the curtains on the stage and not be allowed often on the center stage of life and learning in schools. But what happens to a theater production if imagination and creativity, which is play, does not appear in the production on stage. It's incomplete. It's lacking. And guess what? We leave an intermission. We leave the theater. And you know what? I think children check out too. This is not fun. This is not interesting. I can't use the thing I do best. Remember again, emotion and passion drives up cognition. Play brings the emotion, the passion. New slide the human connection to the main stay, stage. You see, a lot is at stake. It is, we, this is a high stakes time, but I believe it's high stakes for play. Will our children learn to make decisions? Will they learn to solve problems together and collabor collaborate if they are not allowed to play with each other in complex forms of play? I have introduced a stage analogy here, and I really do love it, because we marginalize things sometimes in education that really are of critical importance and need to be center stage. And we as teachers need to be creative to see that. Don't children play out dramatic scenarios using stage directions? You be the bad guy, and I'll be the one who catches you. Don't explode the towers first. We have to surround and hide first. That's part of it. Then they say, the forest will be where the princess hides until the bad guy is gone. Consider this. When plays offstage, behind the curtains in the wings, without a place in the curriculum production, 
How are children to identify and confront their villains? How are they going to learn which is the bad guy, which is the good guy? In conclusion, will you ask yourself, who will you be as an educator? What role will you play when other teachers and parents <coughs> act out the story of the educational future of your children and grandchildren? I want to read you the slide that's up there by Vivian Paley. Paley I think this is a very, it, it's two slides, and it's a very compelling statement in her book, A Child's Work. We all continue to call play the work of children while reducing its appearance to brief interludes. There's barely time to develop a plot or transform and perform a bad guy into a hero. The educational establishment has ceased admiring the stunning originality of its youngest students, preferring lists of numerical and alphabetical achievement goals. We who value play must do more than complain of unwanted drills that steal away our time. We must find time for play and keep daily journals of what is said and done during play if we are to convince anyone of its importance. Our children will happily join us in the project by giving us their wonderful stories that so well explain their play when the stories are acted out. I hope that some of the resources, I, I do have on the very last slide today, I do have some of the resources I've used to share my thoughts on play with you today. And um, I didn't put my email on here, Dr. Bull, and I should, because I'd, I'd really love to hear from you and hear your response. And, and I, all I've done is um, sort of put my toe in the water of this huge, huge um, topic and at the Play Institute we're always looking for ideas and we're also looking for new members and I'd love to send you or email you more information on the Play Institute and the festival. Um, thanks and keep playing and keep using it. Dust it off, bring it back into your school and your classroom. Thank you. God bless. So thank you very much, Dr. Sider. We have a few minutes. If people would like to share some comments or pose some questions for Dr. Sider, please feel free to type those in the chat box on the left-hand side. You may note that I sent a link. Uh, Dr. Sider mentioned the crisis in the kindergarten, so we posted a link to it. You can click on that, whether you're here live or you're listening to the recording. You can click on that, and it'll take you to the document. And you also have Dr. Sider's email. So here's an email, uh, a question from Tanya. Dr. Sider, what would you consider an appropriate amount of recess time for kindergarten students? Well, research t research recess time is a different kind of playtime and a very important one, especially with outdoor play. Um, normally, in a six-hour day, I would say realistically, you would have a would have time for at least two two recess times. Often, there's one right after lunch, at least 20 minutes. Children cannot really get a scenario going without 20 minutes. And then another one with a, for a half an hour. The um, advice of the Alliance for Childhood is that in a six-hour day, there should be three hours of play. Now, not all that is recess. Recess is yet more of a, a physical and not so much a scenario. I, I don't know if that helps. But the other hour they're talking about would be that integration of play into your classroom in centers. Is that what you meant? So Tanya, uh, we want to make sure we don't bring back to the board that we should have a three-hour recess. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, right. no, it's not a three-hour recess. No, I, I was just yeah, thinking. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, Tanya, so yeah, Tanya says yes, thank you for the good answer. Do we have any other questions or comments? Yeah, 
at recess for the rest uh, of the day. Right, Tanya. Be at recess for the rest of the day. <laughs> I think, Tanya, uh, <laughs> what I would do is probably not call it recess because my latest, ex my latest saying, and this is my quote, yay, play is not a recess from learning. We often think recess is play, and, and it is. But it's so, that's just so a very small definition of play. There's so many different levels, and, and, and recess is very important. But just the very name, think about it, recess. Okay, done learning, not learning anything. I would challenge that. There's a question about uh, junior high. Um, what about, uh, Kayla is interested in, in what you would recommend for junior high. <clears throat> All right, I'm, I'm going to venture into the land of middle school and secondary, mainly because I have some very dearly loved um, family members that are secondary teachers who do teach in junior high and ninth graders in high school. And I believe they're successful because they do play. Uh, in my niece's uh, math class, she'll bring a twister game, and she'll have computational math facts on the different colors and their answers. And so we have children answering them, competing, and then um, we have others watching who are the judges saying, well, that was the wrong answer. You're out. So she said they're getting a lot quicker with their math facts. She's also set up a classroom where the children can have learned to talk with each other, laugh with each other, know they need to get a certain amount of work done, and then it's time to play with the ideas. They, they decorate a Christmas tree with her. She said, I always connect it with math. If something's going on in the sports world, she integrates. She doesn't call it play, but I tell her, I call this play. You are letting the children play with ideas how to apply math to the subject. There's a great book, and I'm, I'm going to forget the name, but it's about humor in the classroom. I, ju I do apologize, because I did present to a junior high group, and they really liked this book, and we played with some of the ideas in it. So Tanya, if you'll email me, um, I will send you the name of that book, because it really helped me in that presentation, because whenever I go higher than sixth grade, I really study for that, because as you know, I'm an early educator. But um, I, judging from my own children when they were in that grade, they were re they really gravitated towards the teachers that knew how to apply what they were doing to the exciting emotional again emotion drives cognition. Always keeping that in mind. I hope that helps. <laughs> we. Uh... So did we get to, uh, right now we have 15 minute time blocks for play periods oh. that we call free time. This mm. is appropriate. We have a seven hour kindergarten day. 15 minute time blocks. Would yeah. you be able to put two time blocks together? Uh, the research is pretty clear that for children to get the scenario together and to answer all those questions and that takes about 20 minutes, and then they'd still have 10 minutes to play it out. They really don't need as much time to play it out. Um, my kids to get a tea party or a picnic together took about 20 minutes. And that negotiation, finding the materials, that anticipation, it's sort of like us getting ready for a trip. <laughs> I love it. You know, you're packing, you're thinking, oh, I'm going to need this. I can picture myself on the beach, in the stores, in the restaurants. Part of that is the fun. If I don't have time and I have to be out here at Concordia doing something, five minutes before I get on the plane, I don't get to play with the ideas. I don't feel as I'm prepared for it. And that's how children play. This is the work of uh, James Christie and Thomas Yockey, two names you may want to look at. Um, uh, and again, uh, play at the center of the cur curriculum is the book we use in play theory and practice. They talk a lot about setting, um, setting up uh, the play centers in your classroom. I love the idea that you're using 15-minute links, though. And you can start with that. I'd start with it and, and just have them do smaller scenarios, maybe play mentor them through that, and then, then combine two of them. Good for you. I'm really glad you're doing that. 
I apologize that I'm going to have to cut us off. There's another group that's going to be meeting in the room that we're using right now, and I see them waiting at the door. So thank you, Dr. Sider, so much for this thought-provoking presentation. Uh, I just posted a link to the recording.